بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله Peace be upon you, O Shaheed, O Gharib, O Mazloom of Karbala. May Allah grant us in this dunya his ziyarah, and in the next life his shafa'ah. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If I had to choose one subject and only one and implore the youth, our youth, to focus on, to work greatly on, that would be your parents, your parents. Take care of your parents, respect them, show them kindness, do not neglect them, make them an important priority in your life. And this, unfortunately, the importance and respect towards parents is one of the values that is rapidly being lost in the West. The importance of parents, you find day after day, year after year, it's losing its importance. But when you come to Islam, you find that everything that is good is found in respecting and honoring your parents. You want a good livelihood? You want to live comfortably financially? Islam says, honor your parents. You want to live a long, successful life? Honor your parents. You want to die a believer? Honor your parents. Everything that is good is found in loving and honoring your parents. And like I said, our youth that are living in the Western world, they are losing the importance of parents. They're learning from the Western society that your parents aren't that important. Parents don't hold such a prominent position in the West. Unfortunately, the relationship that we have that is found in the Western world is a relationship of benefit, interest only. Your mother is a maid to you. As long as she cooks for you, as long as she washes your clothing, as long as she cleans the house, then you will be happy with your mother. As long as your father, father spends on you, we treat them like ATM machines and takes me to places, I'm happy with them. Where is the love? Where's the genuine love, that relationship that we should have with our parents? There was a father that once told me that his son, he's, di he's divorced from his wife and his son lives, he's a teenager. He lives with his ex, his ex-wife. So he says that my son only calls me Sayyid when he wants money. When it's my birthday, he remembers me. He sends me a text. Why? Because he wants me to send him a gift, send him some money. Unfortunately, this is the new relationship. And I remember I sat with a young man because his father was upset with him. He told me, sit with him. He doesn't respect me. He was about maybe 20 years old. And I told him, what's the issue? He told me, I want to buy this. My father says, no, I want to buy this ticket. He says, no, I want it. It's all about a relationship of benefit and interest. This is what my father means to me and mother. Unfortunately, this is an area that our youth are really lacking today. And that's why I want you, the youth, to pay close attention because we have certain obligations towards our parents. There are certain rights that our parents have against us. And if I do not carry out those rights, my friends, if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, I don't respect these obligations, not only will there be consequences in this life, like I won't see success, I won't be a successful individual, but my children will do the same to me. And I'll, I'll only realize that once I become a parent, and that's why I, there are six important rights and points I want you to pay attention. If you want to make your relationship stronger with your parents and please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, keep in mind these six important points. What are they? Number one, when it comes to dealing your parents, and I know some of them, we already know it. We, are, we have already heard this, but remember the Quran says that we always need reminders. We always need reminders because we human beings forget. So even if we've heard this before, it doesn't bother. There's no harm in hearing it again and again. So we can remind ourselves to apply these teachings. We don't forget about them. Number one, when it comes to your parents, their first right that I have to keep is to always respect them. Never disrespect your parents, my friends. 
sometimes your parents may make a promise. I'll take you to this game. I'll buy this for you. Your mother may make a promise. And then for any reason, they're not able to keep the promise. Never rebuke them. Never yell at them if they forgot, my friends. Even if they didn't have an excuse, but your obligation is not to, is to never rebuke them. Never yell at them. They're your parents. If they made a mistake, do not make them feel bad. If they were supposed to pick you up from school, but they were late, don't hurt their feelings. If they were supposed to do something and they didn't, they forgot, whatever happened, never show them any signs of disrespect. The Holy Quran says, فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفٍ Don't even say off, which is the least sign of dissatisfaction. You know, sometimes your parents don't do something for you and you say, Phew. you know, that's the least sign. You're not yelling, you're not rebuking, you're not talking back to them. No, you're just saying off. The Quran says even this is a sin because these are your parents and you shouldn't treat them like, you shouldn't have a relationship of interest, an opportunistic relationship with them. So this is number one, never disrespect them. It doesn't matter. There is absolutely no justified argument that makes sense, that justifies what you did if you disrespected them. So that's number one. Number two, if your parents try to show you love, my friends, never push them away, never repel them. You know, unfortunately, something that you notice in the Western culture that Children, especially teenagers, they don't like their parents showing them love in front of their friends. If your mother hugs you, if she kisses you in front of your friends or your father, we're embarrassed by that. So what do we do? We push our parents away because that's not cool. That doesn't look good in front of my friends. Brothers and sisters, never push your parents away when they're trying to show you love. And unfortunately, this is something I spoke about that in the West, it's all about friends. Our friends matter more than our parents. When you have a big problem in your life, trust me, it will be your parents that will be to your side. It's your parents that will support you. When you need help and everyone's abandoned you, your parents will never abandon you. There was a brother that told me in this pandemic, I was in the center of a hotspot. I had to leave. I went to an area where I had extended relatives they absolutely re denied me, rejected me because they were afraid that I may carry the virus, the coronavirus. So they said, no. I called a few friends. I'm sorry, we're afraid. I have a sick father. I have a sick mother. I have this condition. My wife is this. He says, everywhere I wanted to go, I noticed that the doors were closed. No one embraced me. No one accepted me except my parents. They told me, our dear son, come to us. Even if you carry the virus, it doesn't matter. The love that your parents have is genuine, my friends. It's not opportunistic, like the love that we have towards our parents, like the love that sometimes our friends have towards us. So that's why never ever repel them. Never ever favor your friends over your parents when they're trying to show you love. I once sat with a son that was having a lot of problems and issues with his father. And I told him, what's the issue? Why don't you listen to your father? Why do you have such a toxic relationship with him? You know what he told me? He told me, Sayyid, my father just doesn't get me. You know, we're from two different worlds. And I was very, very disappointed at this young man. You know what I told him? I told him, well, of course, because your father grew up in the Middle East. You grew up here in America. Of course, he's not going to get you. But that does not justify what you're doing. You're neglecting him. You're abandoning him. You're disrespecting him. And I told him this, that in the same way, that your father doesn't get you, trust me, in 20 years from now, you won't get your child as well. Of course, every generation is different from the next generation, but that shouldn't be a barrier, my friends. The love and compassion that we show our parents doesn't matter if they get us, if they don't get us, if they're not into technology, if, they, if their style of thinking is different. This is something completely natural, and we will only notice that and realize it once we become fathers. This is number two, the second right. Never repel them, always show them love. Number three, the third right that our parents have towards us is what? Against us, that we have to be careful of this obligation, is to show them in my actions that I respect them. It's not enough that, you know what, I say that I love them. You, we have to show it through actions. Like what? Number one, anytime you walk with your parents, Make sure you walk behind them. Don't walk in front of them. This is a sign of respect that you walk behind them. Number two, anytime you greet your father and mother, 
kiss their forehead, kiss their hands. Yes, unfortunately, this is awkward seen in our community, right? A teenager that comes and kisses the, or the, the, the hands of his or her uh, parents, this is something very strange. This is something we don't find anymore in our communities, even though it was so prevalent in you know, the earlier generations. But now it's become something that is absent of our communities. And I remember there was a video of a young man that, that kissed his father's hand in, in, the, in his wedding. This was about a year or two years ago. And subhanAllah, everyone was so amazed and saying, so what a beautiful video is, uh, is this, that a son is kissing the hand of his father. Why? Because we don't find it anymore. We shouldn't be, you know, very, uh, we shouldn't be very, very surprised at this or fascinated. This should be the norm. But unfortunately, because it has become so absent, when we do find someone that kisses the hands of his or her mother, we say, wow, this is a saint. This is an angel. So this is number two. Number three, when they enter the house, your father comes home and you're sitting like a couch potato watching a movie or playing video games or on your iPhone watching social media. When your father or mother come home, stand up, rise, show them that respect. Unfortunately, I see youth, they don't do that. Number four, if you're walking with your parents and they're carrying something heavy, help them. For example, your mother is, is back from the grocery store and she has to unload. Go and help her. If your father needs help, sometimes, you know, I'm invited to someone's friend, uh, to a friend's house and he has a son, a teenager. The father is helping, he's, he's carrying everything, bringing the tea, bringing the food. And his son is just sitting like a king doing nothing. Go and help your father. Show them that care. Show them that love. So this is number three. Express your love, your compassion, and, and respect through actions. Number four, the fourth right. Try your best. And I know this is a little tough, but trust me, wallahi, you will see so much success, so much good if you try to do this. Try your best to never reject any request that your mother or father makes you. And I said, like I said, this is not easy. And there are some parents that are very high maintenance. They want too many things. The standard is too high. Do this, do that. They think their children are servants. You know, they're like slaves to them. This is wrong, of course. But try your best to never reject your parents when they make a request. You know, I see some young ones when their father asks or their, uh, their mother, not even young ones, you know, I've, even older individuals, when their older parents ask them to do something for them, they see it as a burden. Oh, tomorrow I have to take my father to the doctor. Tomorrow my mother wants me to go with her to do this. Tomorrow I have to do this or that. Whatever it may be for your parents, my friends never see it as an, a burden. It's an honor when my father asks me to help. It's an honor when my mother wants me to help her in the kitchen, outside the kitchen, in the house. She needs help fixing something. It should be an honor and not only help them. You should be the one that initiates. Don't wait until my father comes. Don't wait until my mother comes and asks for help. No, I should offer them every day. Ask them, mother, do you need any help in the house? Father, do you need help any, in doing anything? Sometimes our old parents, maybe they don't know English or they can't understand it very well. Ask them, maybe they need help, some papers, reading the mail, doing certain forms. Show them that you care. Show them that love. T tell your parents from time to time, you know what, I'm going to go do the, do the groceries for you. Yeah, I don't want it hurt, especially during this pandemic. Old people, they're at risk. So it's difficult for them to go and do the groceries. You do it for them. Go once a week, twice a week and help them do the groceries for them. So this is number four. Try your best not to ever reject any request that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does for you. Make a vow, sit tonight, say, Ya Allah, I'll try my best from tomorrow to never reject when my father and mother tell me to do something. I'll try my best to never say no. You'll see how Allah changes your life for the better. Wallahi, you will see so much success in your life. This is number four. The fifth right that we have to be very mindful of when it comes to our parents be loyal with your parents in the same way that they loved you and cared for you when you were a child, when you were in need of them, you show them that same care and love when they are old and in need of you. How unfortunate is it that when our kids are young, that when our parents, when we are young, they take care of us, they love us, right? They do everything for us. But when they are old, we send them to the nursing homes. 
you see some individuals, they may have a valid excuse for sending them there. Maybe they really can't. Their house doesn't have any space. Maybe they have a certain medical condition that prevents them from caring uh, for their parents. But the vast majority of people, my friends, nursing homes is an un-Islamic concept because you're supposed to raise your kids. It's like sending your child to a nursing place that they raise them and you visit them once a week. What is that? Isn't this, isn't this uh, a form of a disrespect that I'm showing my child if I do? It's, it's a form of you know, uh, cruelty towards my child. But why is it normal when, I, when my parents need me? I send them to the nursing home. And we saw what happened in this pandemic. The greatest individuals, groups that were at risk and the largest victims uh, in this pandemic were the nursing homes. I read in the U.S. 40% of the deaths in June, they were people in nursing homes. They're all these sick people together. One person gets sick, everyone else is going to get sick and be at risk. And I've seen some old people, my friends, when they're old, because they're retired, they don't have too much to do. If their kids aren't around them, around them they really get bored. They need that love, compassion. I know an, uh, a neighbor uh, in, the, in the U.S., of my parents' house, an old individual, lives in the house. Anytime I go past by their house and say hi, he wants to talk for an entire hour. I could tell he's bored. I had a conversation with him once, and he's like, my parents, my kids, I have three kids. They're all so busy with their lives. They probably visit two or three times a year. They'll call me once or twice a month. Is this how we treat our parents? So when they are in need of us and older, we have to be there for, for them. Spend time with them. At least, this is the least thing we can do. Spend time for, with them. If they need financial help, you give them that financial help. So the same love and care that my parents showed me when I was young, I have to show them when they are old and they are in need of me. And finally, the sixth right that my parents have against me is that I have to always pray for them. Always do dua for them. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them, to give them health. Ask Allah to prolong their life. Ask Allah to help you in carrying out your duties towards your parents. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make your parents satisfied with you. Anything that is good, always do dua for them. And that's why scholars say one of the etiquettes of dua, when you do dua and pray, always begin by doing dua for your parents before yourself. And the Qur'an says, we read the dua of the Qur'an towards the parents, وَقُلْ رَبِّ ارْحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صغيرة. And say, oh Allah, show them mercy in the same way that they showed me mercy. And if my parents are deceased, it's especially even more important for me to do dua for them. Go to their graves, visit, visit them from time to time. Read Qur'an and gift it to them. Hold a majlis and give the thawab to their souls. Go, for example, for ziyara, give sadaqah, whatever good deed you can do, give that to your parents and do dua for them. Because there's a hadith from the Prophet where he says there are some individuals where when their parents are alive, they're grateful, they do everything for them. But when their parents die, they neglect them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes these individuals as ungrateful children, aq. And on the contrary, there are individuals that did not respect their parents. They were ungrateful to them when they were young. They neglected them, abandoned them. But when the parent died, they start to do good deeds for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes them as a grateful individual. So do not forget about your parents if they have been deceased. So these are very important points, my friends, that we have to keep in mind, that we have to learn. Don't learn from the, from the society that you learn from, like I mentioned in the previous lecture that we just care about our friends and my parents aren't cool. No, your parents are the most important individuals in your lives. Now, someone may say, why? Why all this exaggeration and focus on parents? What's the big deal? Why do I have to show them so much respect and never ever say no, never ever disrespect them? When you become a parent, my friends, if you're young and you're not married, you don't have kids, you're not gonna understand why. But for those that have kids, they understand why. When you become a parent, you'll know what you go through to raise that child. You know, when the child is sick, the parents don't sleep. The parents are so distressed over their child. When the child is hurt, the parents are hurt. When the child is hungry, the parents are, you know, at, the parents can't focus. The parents are in distress. You know what your father had to go through to provide for you, to make you happy, 
we only realize what my father did for me and my mother did for me, all the agony, all the sleepless nights, only once we become parents. And that's why a man came to Rasulullah one day and he told him, Ya Rasulullah, my mother is old and I did so much for her. I would carry her on my back. I would feed her with my own hands. I would take care of her personal hygiene. I would do everything for her, just like a child. Ya Rasulullah, have I repaid her for all the favors she has upon me? The Holy Prophet said, no, never. And then the Prophet gave the explanation, the reasoning why you can never repay your mother. He said, because look, every single body part, listen carefully. If you think about it, subhanAllah, it's mind boggling. Every single body part of your mother was at your disposal. Her entire body was at your service. She, she, you know, she prioritized you and favored you over her own comfort. The Prophet said, Remember, when your mother was pregnant, where did you live? She gave you her womb, her stomach to live in. You don't think that's discomforting, that's painful sometimes. Nine months, someone is living inside you. Can you believe what your mother did for you? And then he says, So her womb was your home given to you, even if it meant she doesn't sleep and she's in pain. Her breast was the source of your food, even if it was inconvenient for her. And then he said, Her feet were your vehicle. You know, a child, they want to go somewhere, they start crying, the mother or the father, they have to carry them to that place. So my mother is like my vehicle. And then the Prophet said, Your mother's hand was your shield, your protection. She protected you with everything through her hands. So her hands were for you to protect you. And then the Prophet said, And her lap was your seat. Whenever you're bored, whenever you feel lonely, you just go and sit. You don't even ask. You go and you sit in your mother's lap. Like it's a seat. Like it's a chair. So every single part of her body is at the service of her son. But when this ungrateful son gets older, and she tells him, my dear son, take out the garbage, we start saying, my mother is so high demanding. Your mother is so high demanding. Look at what you did to your mother. Look at what she did for you. You lived inside her and every body part was for you. And now just one small request is too much. Don't never do that, mother and sisters, or else we will also, we will also feel that pain when my children do the same thing to me. And thus the Prophet, he says in one hadith, he says, if you serve your mother as much as the drops of ocean. That's how many days you serve your mother. The, as, men, as many drops of ocean, in the ocean there are. And the particles of sand, so basically trillions of days forever. You will not repay your mother for one day of pregnancy. One day of pregnancy. So nine months, you're not even gonna pay for one day. And let her not loan after the pregnancy and after the first year and the second year and the third year. So you can never repay your parents for what they did for you. You know, there was an interesting video on YouTube that I saw. It's about a fake job that they did. Uh, but the people that they interviewed didn't know this is a fake job. So it was done through uh, online, you know, over, through Zoom, for example. So people went and applied and they had to be interviewed through the computer. So all of a sudden, some guy starts interviewing them. So he gives them the information about this job. Some of you may have seen this. It's very interesting. SubhanAllah. It's very inspiring. So he tells them this job needs a lot of mobility. You need to be able to work throughout any position possible. For example, sometimes you have to work while you're standing. Sometimes you're laying down. Sometimes you're sitting down. Sometimes you're running. Sometimes you're, for example, driving. So work is going to require for this job a lot of mobility. The work hours. Sometimes you'll have to work up to 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then they show the reactions of those people. Are you serious? What type of job is this? So then he says, you need to be able to work in a chaotic environment. Sleepless nights. Sometimes you won't be able to sleep. So they ask, are there any breaks? And he says, the interviewer, Yes, but only after your associate eats, you can eat. The priority is to the associate. 
to the associate. Now you can imagine if there is such a job, they should probably pay you a million dollars, right? For that a year, because it's crazy. So they say, what's the uh, salary? And he says, the salary, uh, it's a zero. You're not gonna be paid anything. So they say, are you serious? Zero? No, this is cruel. Nobody's gonna accept this. No human being is gonna even think about taking this job. He tells them, no, trust me. <laughs> there are so many people that have their, this job already. Billions of people. Who? He says, your mother, mothers. And then they say, wow, you're right. SubhanAllah, my mother truly has this job that she has to raise me 24 hours a day. Even at 3 a.m. if I cry, she has to go and make me milk and you know, bring medicine for me and whatever. My stomach is hurting. I'm bored. I'm tired. I'm just crying for no reason. Whatever it may be. They have to work through a chaotic environment. They only eat after the child eats and they get nothing out of it. Zero pay. Can you imagine how much we are in debt to our parents? So this is our mothers. And then, and then they show all those individuals being interviewed. They start crying and they say, wow, I never thought about my mother. I love you, mom. You did so much for me. You did so much for me, but I never even appreciated it. I never thanked you for everything that you did for me. They say that there was a mother once. I read this very heartbreaking and inspiring story about a mother who had a child, just one child, and she was a single mother. This mother had a particularly distorted face because of an incident that had happened. So as the child began to grow, he grew uncomfortable with his mother being around his friends because of her, the distortion in her face. So anytime she would come and show up where his friends would be, he would feel uncomfortable and he would tell his mom, mom, please don't show up when my friends are here because you embarrass me, I'm ashamed. And he told her, please, when you pick me up from school, don't come right next to the school because my friends will see you and they'll start mocking me and mocking you. So don't, I'm embarrassed. Just go and park somewhere far when you drop me off and when you pick me up and then I'll walk. And she said, okay, she never complained because she understood the issue here. She understood that her face was distorted. He would tell her when my friends come home, please go in the room and don't show up. I don't want them to see you and they're, they'll speak against me and they'll make fun of me. She never said anything. She said, fine. So throughout his life, his mother became the source of a stigma, source of his shame and embarrassment. He never loved her because of that distortion until he decided after I graduate, I'll leave my mother. Finally, I'll be relieved of all this. And he left, he moved to another city. He started working there, studying there. He got married and he never even asked about his mother. He never came to visit his mother because she would always remind him of those days, uh, uncomfortable days. So he got married, he had a child, he continued his life until one day his mother decided to go and visit. She bought a ticket, she booked a flight, and she went and she surprised him, she brought a gift. And now she knew he, he had, she had a grandson. Her son had a son as well. So she came to the door, she knocked the door. Who opened the door? Her young grandchild, maybe four or five years old. He opened the door, he looked at her face and he started crying. He went back saying, monsters, there's a monster at the door. So the son, the father, he came, who's this? He went, he saw it's his mother. His mother wanted to hug him. My dear son, it's been so long, I haven't seen you. But he shrugged her off. He, he quickly rejected her and he said, how dare you come and follow me? You destroyed my life. And now you want to destroy my son's life? How dare you come and follow me? He said, never ever come back again. He shunned her just like that. She left with a broken heart and with a tearful eye, that my son doesn't love me. All, I, all the things I did for him, but because my looks, what can I do about my looks? There's nothing I can do. This is how he treats me. She went back with a broken heart. A while later, he received news that his mother died. So he said, let me go attend the Fatha. Let me attend the burial. He went, he attended. After he went and visited his mother's home, as he was looking through all the papers and everything that was there, he found a letter from his mother to him. 
His mother had brought this letter to give him when she visited, but he never gave him the chance. So he opened the letter and it was to him. My dear son, it was from the handwriting of his mother. This is a letter from me to you. I want you to forgive me. This is how she began the letter. The mercy and love that parents have, Wallahi, he will never be matched by anyone. Even if we disrespect them, even if we hurt them, even if we bother them, they will still love us regardless. So my dear son, please forgive me for all the discomfort that I caused, the embarrassment throughout my life. I'm so sorry. I wish it was otherwise. I wish I could have changed that, but it wasn't in my hands. But I want to tell you something, my dear son. I want to tell you why my face was distorted. You never even asked me. The reason is because when you were a baby, there was a fire that happened in our house one day. Your father died in that fire. And you almost died in that fire. You were all alone in your room. And it was either that I save my life and go out, or I go and I save your life. I decided to put my life on the line. I went and I tried to save your life. And I did manage to save your life, but there was a cost to that. My face burned in the meanwhile, and that's why it was distorted. So I want you to know, my dear son, that the reason why my face is distorted, which has caused you so much inconvenience, is because I wanted to save your life. It's because of you. And then she says, but despite that, I will always love you and cherish you, my dear son, no matter what happens. Love your mother. When he read that, he broke into tears. He started crying. But what's the point after it was too late? Everything that I did towards my mother, all that hate that I showed her, all the times where she tried to come near to me and I said no and I pulled back and I pushed her away. It was because of me. It was all my fault. But what's the point? She's dead now. She's dead now and there's nothing I can do to change that. Brothers and sisters, let's not wait until it's too late so that we start a new chapter with our parents. If we have been ungrateful, if we have been negligent, I've just cared about my family, my kids, my wife, my spouse, my business, my entertainment, and my parents were never a priority. I can start changing it before it's too late. Go to your parents. Tell them, my dear mother, my dear father, I love you. Hug them. Show them the love. Wallahi, it's not shameful to do that. It's not a sign of weakness. Hug them, love them, kiss them on their forehands, take their hands and kiss them. Tell them, my dear father and mother, I love you. Anything you want, I will do for you. Just please forgive me. I want to start a new chapter. Wallahi, that will be the best decision that you will do in your lives. Subhanallah, what did Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam do? to the mothers of the shuhada of Karbala, such that they were all racing to sacrifice their children, their most prized possession in this life. That they were all racing to sacrifice their children to Aba Abdullah al Hussein. What did the love of Aba Abdullah al Hussein do to those mothers that all they wanted was for Imam Hussein to accept their sacrifice, their children for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See Al-Qasim ibn al-Hasan, he's a young boy when he comes to his uncle Aba Abdullah al Hussein, and he tells him, my dear uncle, uncle, give me permission to go and fight. He says, I am embarrassed from your mother. How can I allow you to go and fight and die for me while your mother is looking? He tells him, my dear uncle, worry not about my mother because it is my mother that is encouraging me. It is my mother that is telling me, go and defend your lonely uncle. It is my mother that even put on my armor. She gave me my sword and she's pushing me to the battlefield. Allahu Akbar. This is what the love of Hussein does, that even your child that you love more than your own self, you will offer that as a sacrifice for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Because Imam Hussein was so madloob, he was gharib in Karbala all alone. No one could say no to Hussein. No one could leave Hussein alone in Karbala. This is one story of Al Qasim, and we have the other story of Wahab. Wahab al Kalbi was a Christian young man. He was a newlywed. Even though he was Christian, but he had a very pure heart. A heart that led him to Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam Imam Hussein alayhi salam it is reported when he was going to Karbala, he 
stopped at an area and he rested there. Next to him was the tent of Wahab. Wahab was there with his wife. They were newlyweds for a couple of weeks and his mother. Imam Hussein alayhi salam knew that Wahab was an honorable man and thus he went to Wahab and he asked him to join the camp of Hussein. He asked him for his support. Wahab went back to the tent. His mother is there. His wife is there. And he told them, Hussein wants me to defend him. His mother right away said, my dear son, Hussein seems, seems to be like an honorable man, a man of God, a man that is worthy of defending and supporting. Let, him, let us go and join the camp of Hussein. His wife complained. His wife said, Wahab, we've just gotten married for a couple of weeks. You want to go and fight? What if you're killed? What am I going to do? I'm going to be a widow. But his mother kept on insisting, so he accepted. They all went and joined the camp of Imam Hussein. It was the day of Ashura, and the battle had begun. The mother of Wahab, she came and she told them, my dear son, subhanAllah, you see how this mother encouraged her son to give her life? for Aba Abdullah al Hussein, My dear son, I want you to go and I want you to fight for Imam Hussein. So Wahab took his sword, he went, he fought, but then he came back, he slipped, he came back. He told her mother, have I made you proud now? She told him, no, unless you are killed in front of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, only then I will be happy with you. She told him, how can I accept? that the mother of Imam Hussein, Fatima al-Zahra, is deprived of her son. How can I accept the fact that the son of Fatima is killed or will be killed, but my son isn't killed? I must console her by giving my own child as a sacrifice. Go until you die for Aba Abdullah al Hussein. But his wife said no. She kept on complaining, Wahab, don't go. If you're killed, I will be left as, an, as a widow. Please don't go. So he doesn't know, he's hesitant, but his mother is encouraging him. So he says, I'm sorry, my wife, my dear wife, I have to go. He takes a sword and he leaves for the last time. As he was leaving, all of a sudden he heard his wife come out of the tent and she is yelling him. She's yelling and she is telling him, oh, Wahab, go, go, go and give your life for Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Wahab comes back and he asks his wife, what happened, my dear wife? You were just preventing me. You were telling me, don't go. Why did you all of a sudden change your mind and tell me to go and give my life for Abba Abdullah al Hussein? His wife tells him this. He tells him, because before you left, I heard the cry of Hussein. I heard him call out, Allah al Nasrin Yansuruni. Allah al Min Mu'in and Yu'inuni. Is there no one left to protect the family of Rasulullah? Is there no one that wants to protect me and defend me? The Imam said, I'm so lonely. I don't have any companions or supporters. She says, when I heard the call of Hussein asking for help, he truly broke my heart. I said, how can I prevent my husband from protecting this lonely madhloop? How can I protect my, how can I, Deny my husband from going and helping the lonely, the mazloom, the gharib. Please go and support Aba Abdullah al Hussein. This was another factor. Not only the love they had for Hussein, but because of how oppressed Imam Hussein, how lonely, how mazloom he was. No one could say no except those enemies. That's why she told them, Go, Wahab, and give your life for Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Assalamu. عليك يا مولا يا غريب يا مظلوم يا شهيد كربلاء Brothers and sisters, let us turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us raise our hands and supplicate to the Almighty Allah. 
We ask you, Ya Allah, with the broken hearts that we have, with the tearful eyes that we have. We ask you to forgive us. We ask you to purify us. We ask you to bless us, to answer our hajat, to accept our amal. We ask you, Ya Allah, to give us the tawfiq that we can honor our parents, that we can always respect them, that we can always serve them. We ask you, Ya Allah, if we were ungrateful towards them to forgive us. We ask you, Ya Allah, to help us so that we can always be grateful towards them. We ask you to hasten the reappearance of the 12th Imam to make us amongst his companions amongst the supporters and we ask you ya allah to forgive all the mu'mineen al mu'minat and let us end by reciting surah al-fatiha for all of the believers that have passed away after a loud salawat for muhammad and al muhammad allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala muhammad bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim